So again, if you'd like to connect with us, you can do so at any of the ways on the screen. The easiest way is middletownnjhistory.org or to follow us on social media. And with that, I will introduce our uh, chair, chairman of our speaker committee. It's Randall Gabrielan. who will introduce our speakers tonight. The Middletown Township Historical Society is pleased to welcome, as its July 2023 speakers, Al Savalane and Matthew Ward. Al has a distinguished record, educated at Gettysburg and Georgetown, served with distinction in the military, and spent his career as an educator. He is best known as a historian for his deep, incisive knowledge of the Matawan uh, area, where he served the Historical Society for many years. He has written other books in addition to tonight's uh, History of the Raritan uh, Bayshore, co-authored with um, um, uh, Matthew. Uh, and we're uh, pleased to mention also among his accomplishments is the receipt of the 2019 Jane Clayton Award, Monmouth County's Historian of the Year designation. And I'm pleased to say I was part of the uh, selection uh, committee. Matthew is a journalist and a historian. He too has served in the uh, military. His specialty is boxing. He has written on the subject uh, previously, and he is, as I mentioned, Al's co-author on the Raritan Bayshore. The book is available for sale. I have read it. It's a worthy publication, and I'm sure you too will enjoy it. Al and Matthew, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Um... Thank you, Randy, for that great introduction. Um, thank you, Tom, for having us. And thank you to the Middletown Township Historical Society. Um, believe me when I say this is a true honor to stand up here and, and speak in front of all of you today. Um, as a native son of Monmouth County, it's always an honor to get back here and talk about local history. So thank you for having us. Uh, tonight, I'm here with my co-author, friend, uh, fellow Army veteran, fellow American Legionnaire, Legionnaire um, Al Sablin. Um, Al and I got to know each other through the American Legion uh, many years ago. Al was kind of the, what it looked like the, the lifelong commander at that time, just because of his, his work and his influence within the local veterans community, especially within the American Legion. Um, myself and a couple of other uh, younger guys uh, came in uh, recent veterans of uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. Al and a lot of the uh, other members who were who were Vietnam era guys welcomed us with open arms um, and full graciousness. Um, I truly appreciate that. Al and I discovered soon after that we had a shared interest in local history. Um, talked many years about potential projects we could work on. Unfortunately, I was so wrapped up in boxing history, whereas Al was kind of wrapped up in Matawan history, as well as the 1916 shark attack. We finally found some common ground on a project we could work on, and, and that's the book that we'll be uh, talking about tonight, The Raritan Bayshore. Well, one thing I, I wanted to mention, everything that uh, Matt Cohen did was really good. Uh, after we were, he was interviewing me one time, and we started to realize through the interview that we had more in common than we imagined. And from that, it led to uh, working together in America and becoming very close friends. And also with uh, with this particular project too, you know, both of us were very excited about dealing with a region. You know, we talked we talked about narrow topics before, but this was a region that we wanted to, to do justice for, in two ways. One, for people who live in the region who probably don't know a lot of the special stories and uh, facts that would be very, very interesting for them. And also people from other parts of the country. I learned that when I when I written my shark attack book, uh, that I would I would get uh, letters from people who uh, lived in Arizona, people who actually lived in Europe, and they and they said that I've never been to the Jersey Shore, I've never been to New Jersey, 
But after I read your book, I felt that I was there with you. And uh, that's something that once an author hears something like that, that's about, about as good as it can get in, a, in this lifetime. Uh, the one thing I did want to mention, because a question I'll often get when uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing a, a, a program like this, uh, I have three names uh, on the, as the author, John Allen Savlin. Now, some people think, well, that's, that's kind of pompous. Why don't you use your middle initial or why don't you use your first name or your last name? So I thought I'd answer that question right away. I've got to point out to you that I am a storyteller. And uh, I've gotten that through my many years of being a teacher and trying to make history interesting to middle schoolers. So I've, I've, I know a lot of stories. But one thing, uh, you know, I, I always point out that typically when you have three names you ha associated with something, it's usually a presidential assassin. John Wilkes Booth, Lee Harvey Oswald, when you have three names. And I've got, I've got to point out at the very beginning, I have no intention of doing anything like that. But also, there are people like John Paul Jones, who is uh, the father of the American Navy, and uh, uh, John Stuart Mill, who is one of the most famous uh, you know, philosophers in the, in the late 19th century. And he had something, he was considered one of the smartest men that ever lived. When he was three years old, he could write with, he was ambidextrous. He could write one hand writing Greek, one hand writing Latin simultaneously at three years old. And I knew that when, when that happened, that uh, you know, I, I could never even get close to that league. When I was three years old, I could only write Latin with one hand and French with the other hand simultaneously. So I knew he had me beat for that. But uh, the, the real reason for the story is, uh, in my family, uh, we, everyone in the family was named John. Uh, uh, John Tall John, Short John, this, that. And I would have been John Boy if I didn't use my middle name. <laughs> so I, I started using my middle name and uh, pretty much through, uh, you, know, uh, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school. Uh, even college, it worked. There was one place where it didn't work, the U.S. Army. When I went in the Army, you know, after I was commissioned as a second lieutenant, uh, they don't believe in using your middle name. They don't care whether you prefer it or not. You use your first name. Uh, one thing about in everyday life, you have my way, your way. In the Army, there's one way, and that's the Army's way and you use your first name and you can put in a middle initial, but none of this business about you prefer your middle name. So that's, that's really the story of why, uh, but I, I answered all three names. And uh, remember the old saying, a very old famous old saying, call me anything you like, but don't call me late for dinner. So you can call me anything. I use Al, Al is my name for everyone who knows me. And, uh, but uh, that, I, I just wanted to explain that I wasn't trying to be pompous with that, but I figured somewhere, it, it's on my birth certificate, John Allen Savlin. So when I write a book, I'll put John Allen Savlin, just to, you know, please that particular side of me. But uh, what we're gonna be doing today is uh, we're, we're talking about a region. And uh, there are a lot of, uh, one thing we, we wanted to do in this book, Obviously, when you're doing a book of this nature, talking about over 15 different communities, there's a limit as to how much detail you can go into any one. But what we wanted to introduce was the concept of how people in the region have things in common and how they feel comfortable with each other, how they feel comfortable going to other towns and not feeling like I'm going to a different town or this or that, or you're going to a favorite restaurant in your region. And that's what we tried to do with uh, with our and uh, one thing that we have some you know representations we're going to be showing you pictures, but uh, this is a, a very very small fraction of what's actually in the book. So, Matt, um, we can move in. All right, let's uh, start off with a location uh, here in Middletown that should be very familiar to just about everybody in this room. Al, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, actually, this, this church actually goes back. With the or con congregation was founded in 1702, which goes way back. And actually was organized. It was given a, a charter uh, you know, by King George in England in 1738. The actual building was, was set up in uh, 1744. 
but there's some, there's a little story that goes with this. And if you're a history buff and you, and you like the sidelights, uh, there was a certain person who was a member of this congregation early in the day, early in the years. His name was William Lees. Now, William Lees was also a cohort of Captain Kidd. And uh, Captain Kidd had quite a bit of activity down in this area, in Raritan Bay, when a lot of the travel coming back and forth, going to New York Harbor, going back out. Uh, uh, Captain Kidd, Blackbeard, Edward Teach would be in this area here. Sometimes people on the shore would actually work with some of the pirates. Now, people say, what is a privateer? Because Captain Kidd actually started out as a privateer, which was a legal profession in those days. A privateer is a pirate who works for the government. So you, anything that you take in a raid, you share with the government. And the government says, that's OK, because we're getting a share of it. So we're not going to call you a criminal. But uh, Captain Kidd actually started to realize that he didn't quite like this arrangement. It might be easier if I, I kept everything if I did all the took all the danger and things like that that's when he actually became a pirate and that's when we think William Leeds got involved with Captain Kidd so a lot of the money that uh, was uh, attributed to this church was from William Lee he's actually buried there uh, and you know which we, we he, he was a pirate but we don't we, we don't say too much about it because he did it he did a nice job of uh, right, building uh, Christ Church okay one thing this is uh, in Middletown. The, Middletown, there's so much history in Middletown that uh, as a historian, you know, when you really get into it, your head starts to spin. And uh, one thing, I, I was a, a docent at the Burroughs Mansion in, in uh, Madawan uh, for 20 years. And the first thing I would talk about with the American Revolution, most people think the simple version, uh, you know, uh, uh, the red coats and the Minutemen and the and the Minutemen men would come out and they'd shoot and, and eventually uh, the Minutemen won and, and and defeated the red coats. Sounds nice, very simplified version. It didn't really apply to this area around here. This was very much a civil war. You had people who owed their allegiance, uh, you know, to the king, and uh, and there were other people who also were. were had very strong feelings of not leaving King. They're still showing their leaders. But so, something happened. Whenever, whenever I was uh, doing tours of the Burroughs Mansion, it kind of applies to this here, why people started, neighbors started shooting at each other. I would, I would use this example with the kids. I say, uh, your, your mother every day after you come home from school gives you some money and there's a local store where you can go and they'll have a pizza for you. You give your money and they'll give you a piece of pizza. Okay, you do this every day, and then all of a sudden your mother says, uh-uh, no more pizza for you, no more money for pizza. And I ask the kids, how would you feel? And the kids would look up and they say, oh, no, well, well no more pizza. I, I like going to pizza. This actually would happen in the American colonies. A lot of these people considered themselves Englishmen living in the colonies. They didn't have this concept of being an American hadn't come yet. And... Uh, Actually, the, 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 a part of the arrangement of being a mother country, as long as you do things, uh, you will give us raw materials, we will get uh, manufactured goods back to you, this and that. But as far as the other things about what road's named here, what, which direction you go, you take care of that. Uh, you, know, you don't need that. We are important. As long as the business thing is working, it's fine. Then we had the French and Indian War. And the French and Indian War drained the British treasury. <laughs> And now all of a sudden, we're, we're this being very magnanimous and allowing the colonies to do things, they needed money from the colonies. And uh, they also found out too in the colonies that uh, they didn't have much say in the British parliament as to what, this, what the taxes were gonna be. And they said, wait a minute, how can you do this to us? You've always given us the freedom to do this or that. Now you're taking it away from us. And you kind of see the, the pizza story coming into this. A lot of people who felt they were loyal to England are now feeling that they don't, they don't really care about us anymore. They're taxing us and we have no representation. So gradually, uh, you, a lot of people formed uh, organizations like the Sons of Liberty, which are patriot groups. And uh, a, a lot of other people who were, I have to be fair to the people who were loyalists, because uh, in, in this particular uh, you know, uh, revolution, if you lost, uh, it's, it's more than just, you know, losing uh, this or that or your investments. You could lose your head. And every person who signed the Declaration of Independence, that was their death warrant. If they hadn't succeeded, they would have been executed because the, the British government would not take a chance 
a lot of these people come back later on. So this was a very, very, very intense emotional type thing. In, in Middletown here, there are two families. There was the, the Taylor family in Marlpit Hall, uh, you know, Edward and uh, William Taylor, they were loyalists and they very much felt that they, their, their, their best interest was with the king. And uh, right down the road in uh, Joseph Murray's farmhouse, which this one here, uh, was his member of the militia, uh, the, the colonial militia. And uh, he felt that this is that things are going to change. And now we're no longer going to be have this tie with the mother country. And now the shooting starts and you have people who knew each other are shooting at each other. And eventually, uh, Joseph Murray was arrested for his uh, you know, attacks against the, the loyalists. And right after they released him, he was working on his farm. And men who were employed by uh, Edward and William Taylor uh, bayoneted him and then shot him in the back. And uh, so you could see even with neighbors in this particular area, it was not a simple type thing. And it, whenever there's a civil, I would always tell you know young kids, all wars are bad. If you think a war is good, you just haven't learned enough about it. All wars are bad. But a civil war is particularly bad because now you have family members shooting at each other. You've got neighbors shooting at each other. And all of this happened right here in, uh, in, in Middletown. This is uh, Burroughs Mansion. This, I spent 20 years, uh, this is actually an earlier version, an early 20th century version, because some of those things are no longer there. But that was, uh, was built in 1723, uh, that particular style. So there's a little, sometimes even historians disagree, 1723. And then some historians will say, ar speaking of the architecture, that was more likely in the 1750s rather than the 1720s. So there's their disagreement. I just, I just point that out. Uh, most local groups think it was 1723. That was the word that was spread. So that's what we usually go with. Now, there was a raid here at the Burroughs Mansion. This happened in 17. In fact, uh, the person who lived there was, uh, he was called the Corn King, John Burroughs. He was a wealthy merchant and uh, he was very concerned about what was going on in politics. And he tended to side with the Patriot side. His son, Captain, uh, he later became Major Burroughs, was. Uh, was also one of the first leaders in, the, in this particular area during the American Revolution. And he, he married, and he married uh, the, the daughter of uh, another local uh, patriot, uh, Colonel uh, Samuel Foreman. And so it's very much a patriot family. Uh, now, the loyalists under you know, General Cortland Skinner uh, decided they wanted to capture Captain Burroughs. He was like on number one on the wanted list. And he would, his wife was living with the in-laws here. And uh, they decided the night uh, in uh, September of uh, 1778, they were going to launch a raid. And they were going to come with a group of uh, Skinner Greens from the Sandy Hook area and try to capture Captain Burroughs. And uh, at, uh, they, they came in the area and they, an advance group came actually to the mansion there. And it's, it's about 12 minutes. They're knocking on the door. They, they want to come in. And Captain Burroughs had also picked up the word from Patriot spies. They were coming. So he jumped out the back window. It's kind of interesting. I found this out later. Captain Burroughs had a club foot. So he it wasn't, you know, when you read about him you know, and uh, uh, with his club foot, he was managed to get to Madelon Creek and swim across Madelon Creek. He was safe over there. But his wife and uh, the in-laws were, were still in the house, middle of the night, and boom, boom, boom. Uh, and they opened the door, and now their Skinner Greens come in. And first of all, they're kind of casing, wonder where he is. And they're kind of playing, playing a game. And this, this young girl at the top of the stairs, landing at the stairs, says, what are you doing in my house? And, and they just talked to her a little bit. This, this, this girl, very, these are armed men. And they said to, to, to Margaret, uh, you know, we have some wounded men out here. We would like to have your shawl to bind up their wounds. And this young girl, you know, she's a teenager at this time, says to these group of armed Tories right in their entryway, I'll not give my shawl or anything to aid a British subject. Can you imagine how a speech like that goes across to a group of armed loyalists? Well, they immediately rush her and they, they go past her. One of the uh, Tory officers actually hits her on her chest with the hilt of his sword. And according to legend, she, she dies young, but they, they think that that contributed to her death. And they couldn't take Captain Burroughs. So uh, 
they decided to take his father, the corn king. And they, they took him and they actually put him on a prison ship in New York Harbor. And they were moving out of town and uh, they were gonna burn the Burroughs mansion. And one time I did a reenactment, we had a, a group, a, we were doing a television show and I played, uh, you know, one of the Skinner Greens. And uh, I was saying, burn the mansion, burn the mansion. And all of these, uh, you know, paranormal investigators were picking up all sorts of things. Da, 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 da. What is this? All this activity, because I think I was bringing them back to their time back in 1778. And uh, it, the, the amazing thing after that, you know, we were standing by the stairs right where the raid took place or the, the assault took place. And uh, uh, one of the investigators, they had all kinds of equipment there, television cameras, uh, sound equipment. And she said, you must have really loved your husband saying that those things, to those armed men. And this voice said, yes, I loved him. And it picked up on several, you know, sound recording things. And after that, because normally when you do a paranormal investigation, you don't have a, a cooperating spirit like we had with Margaret Burroughs. But she was very, you know, she was, seemed to be uh, very much with it. And everybody, um, and the ghost in the mansion were concerned that we were going to burn, uh, burn the house. But uh, at that time, uh, a lot of things uh, in the area, there was another building called the Old, uh, old Hospital, where uh, it, this happened in 1779. Right, right, very close to the Burroughs Mansion. And there uh, Samuel Foreman lived. And there was a skirmish with British troops right down at the base of the hill. And they were bringing the wounded up to this building uh, on uh, Ravine Drive. And they, uh, uh, and they were taking it to the, it, that's when it became the old hospital. And there, fortunately, there are many uh, buildings in this area. I did a, uh, I was on a historic, I was a commissioner for the Historic Sites Commission. And I did a, a research uh, uh, project for them and we had over 300 houses in Madawan over 100 years old. So with all of those, you could imagine all the stories that uh, about different historical periods that would, could be told. The next couple of slides um, that Al and I will talk about deal with veterans organizations that have ties to the Bayshore region. Um, the first organization that we'll talk about was the Grand Army of the Republic. Um, the Grand Army of the Republic was a fraternal... Oh. The Grand Army of the Republic was a uh, fraternal organization that was composed of veterans of the Union military, so sailors, soldiers, Marines. Um, the organization was founded in 1866 in Illinois, so shortly after uh, the end of the Civil War. And really, it was founded for the purposes of, of promoting political candidates, um, securing pensions for Union veterans, as well as promoting things like patriotic education um, amongst the communities in which these posts were located. Um, this organization had posts all over the country at that point, including in the Bayshore region. Um, here in this photo, we see um, a group of gentlemen who were connected with the Atlantic Highlands uh, post of the Grand Army of the Republic. But it's important to note that there were GAR posts located all over the Bayshore and communities like South Amboy, Perth Amboy, Keyport, Woodbridge, um, and, and really these organizations uh, did a great job uh, in terms of, of becoming kind of a political powerhouse um, in candidates that they endorsed and, and that they backed, especially uh, in areas like uh, New Jersey. The next organization is really near and dear to uh, Alan My Hearts. Uh, this is the American Legion. Uh, and this post is, this is the Keyport post. Um, this is uh, post 23. Uh, this post was founded in 1919, shortly after the establishment of the American Legion uh, in, in France. So this is really quite a historic um, post in terms of, of, of those located in New Jersey as well as throughout the country. Um, and really, the American Legion has a lot of parallels to other veterans organizations, such as the Grand Army of the Republic, um, in terms of promoting patriotic education, supporting veterans causes, such as, as pensions, uh, dealing with various uh, veterans organizations um, and, and, and whatnot. There are posts, American Legion posts all over the Bayshore area. Um, I, like I mentioned, this is the Keyport post. This is the oldest ongoing post in the region, but there's also posts located in Matawan. One thing we have to mention is our Matawan post is only two years younger 
than this one. So Absolutely, you yeah. By the goal. <laughs> so I'll, I'll often we'll say, yes, you may be the oldest, but we're pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we also have in Madawan a number of uh, notable former members, including uh, U.S. congressmen, as well as local elected officials uh, and whatnot. So, again, the American Legion has truly had a significant impact on not only the Bayshore veterans uh, causes and veterans uh, community, but also internationally. There's posts all over the world um, of the American Legion, uh, and it's really uh, quite a significant uh, organization, especially for the purpose of lobbying and things of that nature. The next individual that we'll talk about um, is Horace M. Thorne. Uh, Horace was born in 1918 in Keensburg, New Jersey, but he relocated uh, with his family to Middletown, where he was, uh, where he grew up. Um, Thorne is a Congressional Medal of Honor recipient uh, from World War II. Uh, he was killed uh, after destroying a German tank in Belgium. Um, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor in, on September 19th, 1945, um, and it's really uh, quite a significant individual within the Bayshore community, um, so much so that there is actually a school named after um, Thorne in Middletown. Um, there's the elementary school that's located, that's located and named after Corporal Thorne. Within the elementary school, we don't have a photo in this presentation, but it's definitely worth checking out if, you, if you're able to have, get access to the building because there are various um, things associated with the life of Corporal Thorne, including his uh, Congressional Medal of Honor, as well as his Purple Heart that are on display uh, within uh, the lobby of, of the school. Um, Corporal Thorne is, is, is buried at Fairview Cemetery uh, here in Middletown as well. This individual um, was a person that I actually uh, knew fairly well uh, from Mattawan Regional High School. Um, this is Lance Corporal Phil Frank. Uh, Phil was born on July 5th, 1983 in Cliffwood Beach. Um, he was born and raised in that area. He went through the Mattawan Aberdeen School District. Um, graduated from Mad Madawan Regional High School in 2002. I had gym class with him. I think it was my freshman year, so I got to know him pretty well. Um, I graduated the next year in 2003. Uh, Phil was just, I mean, the only thing I can really say is that he just was an all-around great guy. He was one of those people they could really rely upon, um, was a good human being, and he was an individual who joined the Marine Corps following his graduation from high school because he was inspired by the attacks on September 11th. Um, Phil was deployed to Iraq, um, where unfortunately he was killed in 2004 um, in the Anbar province. Um, this particular uh, stone, it actually marks uh, Lance Corporal Philip E. Frank Way that's located in Cliffwood. This was dedicated to his memory in 2012. With that, I'll pass it over to Al to talk a little bit more about um, some various topics that deal with uh, government and politics, one of the sections in our book. And we're going to lead off with the Perth Amboy City Hall. Well, one thing that you will find as you uh, read our book, there are a number of firsts that actually happened in this particular area. This building, the, the Perth Amboy City Hall, was actually built in, uh, started in uh, 1714 and completed in 1717. And this is, is still considered, portions of that building are still in use. Is considered the of uh, all the public buildings in the United States. It's considered one of the oldest that is still in public use. There are actually portions of it uh, that at one time, you know, in uh, uh, 1780, 89, 1790, uh, when uh, the New Jersey legislature was meeting uh, uh, and, and they were discussing discussing the Bill of Rights. Uh, a lot of the discussion actually took place in, in this building. This is uh, really uh, an interesting first. And like I said, there are a lot of firsts in this area, but there are a lot of buildings that as you walk around, you say, oh, wow, this has really been around for quite a while. And this is one of the oldest. Okay, this is uh, Thomas Mundy Peterson. And uh, he's, I was actually... Uh, wasn't born in Perth Amboy, but he, he moved to Perth Amboy, lived in Perth Amboy, actually worked in Perth Amboy. And he was the first person who voted after the 15th Amendment was a pass, giving the, the right to vote to everyone, regardless of, of color. And uh, he actually uh, 
was uh, given a, a special pin that he has there by the people of Perth Amboy honoring him for his first uh, his service. He actually voted uh, on March 31st. Now, I know that there's it's some coincidence here, but that happens to be my birthday. So uh, the people in Perth Amboy, they, they treated it as a, uh, you know, Thomas Mundy Peterson's uh, day, but also someday maybe they'll realize, and there was a guy who, who wrote a book about a shark attack and all, a book about Rose Hill Cemetery and wrote a play about uh, uh, Mayhem and Matawam about the Prohibition era. Maybe we could share a little bit of that day with him. I doubt it though. <laughs> This is someone, uh, it's very, he was born in Matawan, Henry Stafford Little, and he was a very powerful politician. He actually went to Princeton University and uh, he was very loyal alumni to Princeton. There are a number, number of buildings in Princeton that are named in his honor. And uh, he actually became president of a railroad. There's a story here between, I hope we have anyone from uh, Keyport here? Okay. So then it's okay. There was a kind of a comp when, the, when they're building a railroad, the long, you know, the New York Long Branch Railroad, uh, they, were, they were trying to decide, is it going to go through Matawan or is it going to go through Keyport? Logically, it would seem to go on to Keyport because it's going down that way, right down the shore. But they eventually send it to Matawan. And Henry Stafford Little uh, suggested something to the people of Matawan. He said, if most of you buy stock in this railroad, uh, when it comes to moving where the, uh, the train tracks are going to go, there's a pretty good chance they will go through Matawan as stockholders, as holders. And so everyone in Matawan went and started buying stock in the, in the New York Long Branch Railroad. And because of all these stockholders, they, they made the decision, the railroad now is going to go through Matawan instead of going to Keyport, where logically we go. There's something else. Uh, Henry Stafford Little died in 1904. I'm also the, the vice president of the Rose Hill Cemetery uh, you know, Association, and I'm the vice president of the actual cemetery operation there. And I, I did a tour of Rose Hill Cemetery, and I actually, that's where my book is coming out from, or the tour that I would, my tour usually would go about two hours. And I could never have enough time to say everything I wanted to say in two hours. So I put it in the book, the things that I couldn't say during my tour. And my wife was always telling me, time to shorten your tour. But everybody seemed to like it. They would stay till the end. So they can look at it. And I mentioned in the introduction of my book, you don't have to read my book all at once. Read a little bit when you're going to bed. And then tomorrow night, read another little bit, another bunch. So, so the, all the, the characters in the story are the spirits from Rose Hill Cemetery. And I mentioned uh, one person in particular, Henry Stafford Little died in 1904. Now, when he died, you might say, he is a man, he's a popular man. Who would come to his funeral? Who would be a, par a pallbearer at his funeral? There were two US presidents who came to Little Matawan to be pallbearers at his funeral. Grover Cleveland, who was a past president, had actually developed a speaking tradition at Princeton University, thanks to Henry Stafford Little. He was there as a pallbearer. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, who was president of Princeton University at that time, he was a pallbearer too, because he had a lot to do with uh, Henry Stafford Little. One thing about Henry Stafford Little, most people don't know about it, he loved football and he loved the football team. Every time the football team had a home game, he would take the whole football team out for dinner. And they always loved this man. So there are a lot of people, you know, a lot of people are known for their historical things. Uh, he was known for being a, a football fan, too. But it's amazing in a little cemetery like that, you have a, a, a funeral where two U.S. presidents come to. So he's one of the guys. Now we'll move into the uh, section of our book that was entitled To Serve and Protect. This partic particular section, it covered a variety of things like lighthouses, police officers, fire departments, things of that nature. So I'll let Al uh, kick it off by talking about the Fort Hancock Lighthouse, another local icon in this area. Well, this lot, remember I said first, this is the first two. This is the oldest continue, continually operating uh, lighthouse in the United States. And it was uh, started in uh, 1764. 
Now, this was on a very strategic area where Sandy Hook was out into Raritan Bay, into the actually Sandy Hook Bay at that point. And it, it would be a place to have a, a military post because if you're coming into New York Harbor, you've got to come through Raritan Bay to go to New York Harbor. So they decided to build a fort in 17 or 1857. Now, if I told you who designed this fort, you'd probably be surprised. The designer was Captain Robert E. Lee. He was in the United States Engineering Corps right before the Civil War. He designed Fort Hancock. And uh, they made it a particularly, uh, you know, a very strategic area. For many, many years, it was uh, uh, with a coast artillery uh, pieces, very huge, uh, you know, guns protecting it. And then after that, uh, it, they turned it into missile base. Now, I have a connection with Fort Hancock. I spent 11 years going out there when I was in the uh, Ready Reserve in the uh, 78th Division. 78th Division is called the Jersey Lightning. And we would go out there to Fort Hancock. And we, we actually had, uh, I had an office in a building like that. I loved it out there because I had a corner office. I would open the windows up on an on a evening or a Sunday afternoon and uh, the, the fresh air would come in. And it was so nice being by the shore even though I was doing my military duty. Also, when we were there, we happened to be a brigade headquarters. So we had a, a, one of our battalions was right next to us at Fort Hancock. And uh, we always looked forward, if we were doing an eight hour shift out there, the complete day, we would have lunch out there. And we'd like to go to the mess hall to have lunch. You might say, well, this is an army mess hall. Why do these guys looking forward to lunch? The chief cook at this mess or this restaurant was one of the major chefs in Monmouth County. In a, in a restaurant, and he would he would put together these unbelievable meals for us. So all morning we could feel our stomach growling, thinking about we can't wait to go to lunch and you know see what he has uh, set for us there. And that was part of my memories of uh, of Fort Hancock. But Fort Hancock now is deactivated, and it's part of the you know the the National Park Service. And uh, but if you'd like to go out there and see some of the gun emplacements and some of these fantastic, they're called they're Stanford White build, buildings. Famous architect, Sanford White, designed these buildings. But it's a nice uh, day trip out there. This next individual uh, could have fit into a couple of different categories in the book or a couple of different sections within the book, uh, just because of the nature of his background as a professional boxer, um, a police officer, and also a volunteer firefighter. Uh, this gentleman is uh, Teddy Loader, who is a uh, native son of Keensburg. Well, he was born in New York, but... He, uh, his family got smart and moved to Keensburg uh, soon, after, uh, soon after his birth. Um, Teddy fought as a professional boxer between 1931 and 1938. Over the course of his career, he amassed a very impressive record of 47 wins, 10 losses, and 9 draws. Following the conclusion of his boxing career, which happened to end in Keensburg at a place called uh, Balbach's Auditorium, um, he embarked on a career in law enforcement. He joined the Keensburg Police Department in 1943, and he eventually retired as the deputy chief of the department in 1975. Um, over the course of his career as a police officer, he was also a volunteer firefighter. So he and many members of his family, including his brother, are very well known around Keensburg. Um, there's still quite a few loaders um, within the community today, um, and they're very proud of, of their family's history within the community. Um, Teddy is also uh, buried like uh, Corporal Thorne at Fairview Cemetery in Middletown. Um, the next individual uh, should be fairly familiar with a lot of people in this room, especially if you're um, Middletown natives. Um, this is the longtime police chief of uh, Middletown Township Police Department. This is Joseph M. McCarthy. Um, McCarthy began his law enforcement career in 1954 uh, when he was hired as a patrolman by the uh, police department. A native of the town, uh, McCarthy served in the Army during World War II. Um, and then on July 12, 1967, he was ultimately promoted to the rank of chief of police in the department. Uh, this was a position that he held for 23 years. Pretty impressive. Well, I think it's only fitting uh, that we go over to the first topic within some of the slides that cover tragedy, death, and remembrance. It's only fitting that I pass it back over to Al Sablin, who is really uh, the shark attack expert. Uh, in this area and then probably around the world, I would imagine, right? <laughs> well, I, I won't 
quite that far yet. <laughs> Maybe someday. <laughs> it's it's actually amazing that uh, a, a local event. This happened in 1916, and there are two participants over here: uh, Stanley Fisher on the left, and Les the boy Lester Stillwell over there. We're, we're, we're part of this, but uh, this incident uh, has. I've written a book on this, uh, you know, uh, and, and there have been other authors. I, we actually did a, a TV movie called Shark, or, uh, the Shark Terror, The Real Jaws, based on, the, in fact, Peter Benchley, when he wrote the book, or the novel, the novel and the book Jaws, he basically re was referring to this. And we couldn't say that it is the inspiration, but it's certainly a lot of people who knew him indicated it was much more than just an inspiration. But I have to say an inspiration rather than the inspiration. But uh, this, this event happened, uh, it, it, we, we hear about shark attacks now. And uh, a lot of people will say, oh my God, there's, there's so many shark attacks, this and that. There aren't that many fatal shark attacks throughout the entire world. And I'm, I'm including Australia and a lot of places that have many shark attacks. Uh, there are shark attacks but uh, fatal shark attacks are, are not that common. In fact, many shark attacks, they're called a, a hit and run. First of all, sharks are not interested in humans. We're not a great uh, dinner for a shark. Uh, they like more fatty tissue. They like larger, they like uh, seals and, uh, and different, different you know, uh, animals like that. So uh, they're not particularly that interested in humans. But back at that time in 1916, there were a series of shark attacks. The first one ha happened uh, in Beach Haven, down at the tip of uh, Long Beach Island uh, on uh, uh, July 1st, 1916. It was a big athletic guy who was from Philadelphia. He was a, he did a recent college graduate. Uh, he decided, and he was staying at, at the, uh, a, a fancy hotel in Beach Haven. And many times at that time, uh, the, the men would like to show off to the, to the ladies. By, by the way, when, when the ladies went to the beach, they, they did not have, uh, you know, string bikinis and things like that. They were almost, uh, you know, looking like they're wearing full pajamas. Uh, and they would, they, would, they would wet their feet and they'd be, they would call it fanny dunking. They would sit down. But that wasn't quite like we, we think of them today. But the men, one thing in common, they, the men like to show off to the ladies before their, their evening dinner at this fancy hotel. And uh, uh, Charles Van Zandt was, was swimming out there, not that far, only about, about 50 yards or so from the shirt. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, uh, he, he starts screaming and they, they see that a, a shark has latched. Well, they, they didn't know it was a shark. Something latched onto him and he's screaming and he's coming, trying to come in and they're trying to release him. The shark isn't going to let go. He's holding on to him and in his upper thigh. And finally, the shark, shark releases him. They bring him onto the shore. Uh, and his father happens to be a, a medical doctor. He runs down and looks at his son. They actually take him to the hotel manager's office and put him on the desk. And they start treating him on the desk. And uh, he, they, 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 could, they didn't have medevac helicopters or anything like that back in those days. And he was bleeding profusely because it was arterial damage. And he died very shortly at that point. Big, healthy guy dies. Now, at that time, this was right around the, the 4th of July season. No one wanted to admit that this could be a shark. So they, they didn't know what caused it. There's something from the deep to cause it, but not a shark. So keep, keep coming to uh, Beach Haven and enjoy the 4th of July weekend. Okay. Something happens. We, we get uh, up to July, uh, July 6th, uh, up in Ocean Grove. Or not, not Ocean Grove, but uh, uh, Seaside Heights. No. Spring Lake. Spring Lake. Spring Lake. Spring Lake. I'm sorry. My mind. Uh, Spring Lake was, was uh, only about, uh, you know, uh, 40 miles up and uh, a strong lifeguard, uh, Charles Van Brunt, uh, was, was swimming out there his afternoon swim and he was attacked uh, by a shark and he's a big man. And uh, he actually, there was one lady uh, said, that it looks like there's a man out there in a, in a red canoe. And as he's screaming, the people a quarter of a mile could hear him. And uh, they start going out. Some lifeguards go out in a boat to him, and they, they start. They pull this man in, and uh, he he seems lighter than he should be. And then they realize his legs are gone. Some had bitten off his legs, not just chewed at them, bitten them off. And they brought him in. He actually died uh, right on the uh, on the beach where they bring him in. 
Oh, now people are getting very, very nervous, and they think more likely uh, that some of the experts uh, who had originally said they could not be a shark, that it's hard to you know pass this off as not being uh, something of that nature. And uh, so a few more days go by until we get to uh, July 12th. And uh, there's some boys, young boys uh, that are uh, swimming in Matawan Creek. Now, Matawan Creek, most people, when they hear the word creek, they think of a little mountain creek coming down, uh, trickling water. Matawan Creek in those days was uh, over 20 feet deep at high tide and had ocean going sco uh, uh, schooners and sloops coming in. So they actually had several wharfs along Matawan Creek, so much deeper during high tide. And these boys had a, 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 a favorite swimming hole. It's called it the Wyckoff Dock that had been abandoned. They, they no longer used it for commercial purposes, but the boys were, were swimming there. And there was something that, before this actually happened, was one of the, one of the local uh, men, who's a Captain uh, uh, Cottrell, who's a you know, former sea captain. And uh, he had no, he'd been walking across the, uh, you know, the railroad bridge, trolley bridge going across uh, Madawan Creek and looked down and saw about an eight or nine foot form going at full speed, heading upstream toward Matawan. And he actually got into his boat. He tried to call the town marshal and said, uh, there's a shark heading toward Matawan. And everybody, he was a bar, the town marshal was a barber and everybody in the barber shop started to laugh. Shark in Matawan, are you crazy? Yeah, and they weren't taking him seriously. So Captain Cottrell jumps in his boat. He starts heading up to Matawan. I call him the Paul Revere on the Matawan shark attack. So he's heading up to Matawan. Uh, and unfortunately, he goes past the Wyckoff dock before the boys come to there, a group of six boys coming down to go swimming. Now, back in those days, uh, the girls didn't really go down to Matawan Creek. It's too dirty and muddy and things like that. So the boys would go skinny dipping. They'd hang their clothes up on a branch and this and that. And the boys are having a good time. They're swimming. L Little Lester Stilwell also has a problem. He's an epileptic. And all the other boys kind of take care of him, watch out for Lester. Because, you know, if, if one thing, if you have an epileptic attack on the ground, it's one thing. But if in the water, it could be very lethal having something like that happen. So uh, they're, they're swimming like this. And he, he was yelling to the other boys, hey, fellas, look at me. I can float. And he was floating. And all of a sudden, some of the boys saw it looked like a board moving toward Lester. And then this happened to be the fin of uh, a shark. And the shark actually attacked Lester. The boys actually saw that it, it, it had a, a, you know, a, a dark back and a white underbelly, which are signs of, a, of a, a juvenile great white. And the style of attack, great whites often come on the surface. They'll come up, they'll take a look at you, then they'll go down. That, that's part of their style. That, that, that actually happened here. So all of a sudden, Lester's a little guy. He's only 11 years old. Uh, and he's, he tries, and the shark takes him down several times. And then the boys realize Les isn't coming up anymore. He's down. There's blood all over the place because all sorts of internal injuries are happening. So the boys uh, climb out uh, under the dock and start running up town. They run up Water Street to Main Street and hang a right on Main Street past the train station and are running toward town. But in the, in the process, they forgot that they were naked. So now you've got these, uh, these five boys running completely nude saying a shark got Lester, a shark got Lester, and they're running uptown. And they, they actually uh, run past uh, Stanley Fisher's business. He was, a, he was 24 years old. Uh, he was a tailor, and he was kind of the time, a town hero. He's a good-looking guy. You know, all the girls were after him, and he, he was very, very popular. He would always help someone out. He knew all the boys. And when the boys said he, he didn't know anything about the shark attack, that, that, that could be true, but something was wrong. These boys coming up nude, screaming about Lester, being gone. So he runs down to Matawan Creek and with he picks up a couple of his friends, uh, you know, uh, Red Burlew and Arthur Smith, two, uh, two local people, and they go down there. And by that time, there's several people down there at uh, the Wyckoff Dock, and there's blood all over the place. There's no doubt that, that there's something horrible has happened there because it really is a serious attack. And they, first of all, they were on a, a rowboat and they're kind of probing with poles to see if they could locate the body. It was a very important thing back in those days. They all of them knew at that time Lester was probably gone. But it was so important to people in those days to have a body, to memorialize a body, to have a funeral, to be able to go to the cemetery and, and to put flower. It's very important to the people of that time. So these men were getting very, very tired and two of them are resting. Stanley was gonna rest too. But he saw the parents up on the, on the wharf there. He said, I'm gonna try one more time. Stanley goes down. 
all of it. And he wasn't in gear, you know, diving gear. It was <gasps> deep breath type gear. He'd go down there, feel around, and he actually located Lester's body, started pulling him up. And uh, while he was coming to the surface, one of the, uh, Arthur Smith was standing there and something very rough went by him and was, was scratched his belly. And, and then that, that, uh, that object started heading towards Stanley Fisher. And as soon as Stanley came up with Lester, the shark attacked Stanley full force. It uh, took, took about 10 pounds of flesh out of his upper right thigh. And uh, he's in really, really in serious condition now. But he's, he's fighting the shark. He's a big guy. He's not going to give up. He's fighting the shark. Finally, the, the couple other men come over toward him, help him out a little bit. And they were able to get him on uh, the dock. And, uh, and, they, and they're put, putting a tourniquet on. At first, he didn't, didn't realize how serious his, his wound was. But then he looked down and he said, oh, my God. He saw his huge leg was completely denuded all the way into the bone. And he, uh, he realized that things were really, really bad at that time. And they actually start uh, carrying him up to the, uh, the train station. And uh, they could have they gone to St. Peter's Hospital, which had been by car, but too rough. They would, people would, he probably would have died with a bit bleeding. Or they could put him on train. So they decided to put him on the train and made it an express train going all the way down to Monmouth Memorial in Long Ranch. And they actually got him there. And he was there for a short time. They were going to have to amputate his leg. But uh, it, it was such a really, really horrible thing. But this is one thing I really have to thank the producer. I was in a film, uh, uh, Shark Terror, The Real Jaws. And they actually gave this whole scene to me that I, I could be and I could explain this. And by about right before Stanley died, he motioned to the surgeon. Uh, he wanted to say something. And he said to the surgeon, I got Lester away from the shark. I did my duty. And he died. And, uh, you know, the, the, at that point, you know, the town was really, really, uh, you know, uh, this is, he was a popular hero in town. And now Lester has died. Stanley has died. These people want revenge. And they're going after the shark one way or another. And uh, actually, there, was, there were a group of men happened a little bit later that actually did capture a, a great white. And it looked like this was about the right size of the great white, a, ju a juvenile great white. And so, you know, it, it could, could have been the, 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 the Matawan Mauler, they used to call it back in those days. But we don't really know for sure. They didn't, uh, there, there were actually pieces of flesh in, in, the, in, uh, in his stomach and bones and things like that. But they couldn't actually, you know, historians are like, you know, it could have been this, 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 this. Well, anyway, uh, the one thing that I try to point out in my book, it wasn't that whether that was the shark or not. I, this brave young man gave his life because he cared about these boys and he cared about the people in this town. And he was willing to risk everything. He had everything going for him. And he was willing to do that for the fellow people in his town. And that's why I, I try to point that out in my book. Um, before Al talks about this next particular topic, the Morgan explosion, I do want to point out that uh, Randy Gabriellen wrote an outstanding book on this particular topic. He was also kind enough to provide us with this very chilling photo um, for our book. And with that, I'll let Al uh, continue the tragedy, death and remembrance uh, discussion. Oh, this is this this happened the very toward the very end of uh, World War One. And this was uh, at, at the, the Morgan uh, shell loading area, and where there are all sorts of things going on. A lot of people were uh, were working there, and uh, a lot of ships, and a lot of women actually working there. And many times they would use the women uh, who as inspectors because the women uh, were extra careful and they didn't smoke, so they en ended up being very very good inspectors. In fact, some of the generals came and they said that all of you working in this plant you know, are, are risking your lives, just like the people over in Europe at that time. And there was an explosion uh, that, that started, there were a series of explosions over three days. And uh, during, these, during these explosions, there were, you know, in, in the neighborhood of a hundred people who were vaporized by this thing. And it, it's still considered horrendous, uh, you know, explosion. And uh, it, it appears what, first of all, they, they, they were, they thought that it might be a German sabotage, uh, but it was a, as a, as a kind of, it looked more like a, you know, human error 
type of thing. But if you're working in very, very dangerous conditions, uh, you know, that's uh, it was saying, in fact, a lot of a lot of the people who they couldn't I identify the bodies per se. So they had a mass grave out of the Ernst uh, uh, Cemetery on Ernst Road, where you can actually go there. And there's a little monument in the front talking about, uh, you know, the, the, this event and uh, that they're that the group of them are, are buried there. And, you know, they're all all together. In the, but person there. Their work for their country and all, all of that is part. Of and a lot of people, you know, always think of, uh, you know, it's the military who are out there being shot at. But uh, there are a lot of other dangerous things that go on during a war like this. And you can see the man in the center. You get an idea of what that crater is like when you see that man in the center in, in, in this. And uh, and then that whole area now has been Morgan has been uh, has been rebuilt over the years. But this was, and it didn't really get as, as much attention as it probably would have because the war ended just within days of that time. So, but this was, uh, Randy did a wonderful book on this because it's, it's one of the best books I've read about, about this whole World War I era. Really, really good book. Another tragedy we have here uh, in, uh, with, uh, in this area. At one time, my mother actually saw this dirigible when she was a little girl and it was passing over the area where where, where we lived and uh, it it actually came into Lakehurst because they had the, the you know the the area there was set for dirigibles a lot of people you know if you don't know what the you hear the term dirigible versus uh, uh, a blimp because a, a blimp is a you know a rubberized uh, you know flying material uh, item Whereas a dirigible has a, actually a structure, a, a metal structure inside of uh, the framing of it. But in those days, uh, uh, the, the, the gas that they used for to, to actually lift uh, the dirigible was hydrogen. And as we know, hydrogen is a, is a very, very volatile you know, uh, substance. Uh, it can burn very, very, uh, very in, intensely. And uh, as they were landing, it was it was a, a kind of a rainy day and was coming in and they were getting ready to uh, attach and to bring bring act the you know the dirigible down and uh, and something happened and it actually exploded and actually went down all the way to the ground and fire companies uh, we that's what we mentioned in the book look from this area actually sent sent uh, you know uh, firemen down there to help uh, you know deal with the situation down at Lakehurst at, at this time and this was uh, uh, <laughs> I hate to say it but this was the the pride of uh, Nazi Germany but uh, still that you know when you see something like this uh, it, you know it, it it is a tragedy that uh, and then we you know it's like other things we learn from the thing and we uh, and uh, uh, helium was 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 used now after this and that was this wasn't the only dirigible that had a problem like this. There were other, other actually some dirigibles from the United States Navy that had accidents, but this was one of the most famous ones. If you've ever heard that uh, there was a man on the radio and for all the humanity, he's crying as, the, as this is happening. And it's, if you ever listen to that, some of these old radio programs, you'll hear about when the Hindenburg, uh, you know, exploded and he, his description of what was happening. But this, this has become one of New Jersey's uh, tragedies over the years. It's also important to note um, another reason we put this in the book was not only the ties with the local fire companies who uh, answered the call to assist with the with the uh, disaster relief, um, but also a piece of the Hindenburg is actually located within the Keyport Fire Museum. Um, so that's a pretty interesting part of a really great collection that they have uh, within the museum of, of a number of, of pieces of memorabilia or equipment associated with not only those, those fire companies in Keyport, but also with some of the other surrounding uh, communities. Now, this is something that most people do not know about. In fact, uh, even toward, toward the there was a major problem with the Man Manhattan Project. Now, now, well, there's a Hollywood movie that's just come out, you know, over the last few days. And uh, Matt and I negotiated with them that we explained to them that if this movie comes out, we have a program at the Middletown Historical Society. And uh, if you could arrange it so that your debut would, would be coordinate with our, our, 
uh, our talk at the Historical Society, we would greatly appreciate it. And we, we were so happy when, when by some miracle, it, it, it happened that they came out over the weekend. And we're still, they're still analyzing that. But uh, what, one of the problems they had, which actually was solved in, in Matawan, when they were putting all of these things together, in addition to the, the idea that we're, this could change humanity and all of this, they wanted to have something that worked. And, uh, you know, this was at a point where you know, the, the Japanese were, were looking like they were going to fight to the very end. And we were at a point where we were going to invade Japan. And if you think of how the Japanese fought on Okinawa, and if you explore World War II, how they fought to the very end, we could imagine what was going to happen if we had to invade the Japanese homeland. And they were going to fight the fight to the end. And that's what they're working on the Manhattan Project. But one problem they had was that with all of the you know the different you know uh, items in there that the, could, could interact? They were looking for a strip uh, a strip plating process that would keep these things separate. And we had a, a, a factory in Matawan, uh, Hanson Van Wickle Munning Company uh, had been there since 1911, and they were in in this business of strip plating. And uh, their chief engineer Wesley F. Hall got involved in this, that he developed a system that they could use his knowledge of strip plating to keep these chemicals and these different elements separate in the bombs. So he contributed his effort and they were able to produce, uh, you know, the atomic bombs that they took over on the I I Indianapolis, uh, another story about sharks. But uh, it, it was, you know, an, an amazing thing. They couldn't say too much until it was all over but he received a special recognition from the federal government for his work to help to bring the, you know, the World War II to an end to, so with the Manhattan Project. And when, when you see something like this, you know, Matt and I even talked about this, you know, would, would anyone, you know, it's, it's so hard when you think of uh, nuclear energy and uh, the positive things it can do, but we also have a chance to see what, what nuclear energy can do in the negative sense. And, uh, but it, it, we both agreed, we're historians, this is history. And people need to know about history. And there's something that local people here could contribute to a major uh, event that could have had a lot worldwide implications coming from a little town like Matawan. So we, we're willing to take our little share of that part. <laughs> okay, here's another, another first. We have uh, uh, Robert, Robert Wilson and uh, uh, Arno, Arno Penzias, who are radio radio astronomers, who were working at my my wife is the expert. She worked at Bell Labs for thirty years, so she is the one who's going to correct me on my Bell Labs observation. <laughs> but there are many things that were going on at Bell Labs, uh, you know, for many many years. And one of the things that they were able to do was through their 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 use of uh, you know radio astronomy is uh, to do to find different elements and different actions and reactions that would eventually lead to uh, you know the the bang theory the big bang theory of creation and so we could say you know this area a lot of firsts have come from this area and some of the exploration of uh, and Kathy had to point out which which one was uh, she, she actually went into meetings with these guys and knew them when she was, you know, back at Bell Labs years ago. So she was the one who corrected me on who, uh, who's who. So these guys actually contribute quite a bit to, uh, you know, what, what we know in, in, in science. And it, these guys are from the Raritan Bay Shore. So. My grandmother, um, who was a native of Matawan, um, she always told me, growing up that Matawan and Keyport has had this like very strange rivalry, um, very heated rivalry in a lot of ways for many, many years. Um, and this rivalry goes back uh, to the early 1900s. Um, my grandmother and some of her high school friends used to try to steal the flag from Keyport High School and bring it back to Matawan High School um, to put on display around the annual football game that happened every fall. Um, you're probably wondering why Christy Mathewson is wearing a Keyport jersey in this particular photo. Christy is not from Keyport. He's from Pennsylvania. Um, of course, Christy Mathewson is a World Series winning um, pitcher who played mostly for the New York Giants um, from 1900 to 1916. 
Um, he had a lot of accolades. He's a Hall of Famer, a very notable uh, pitcher in the history of the, of the game. Um, in September 1904, uh, Matthewson was actually recruited to pitch for Keyport during a break in the season. Um, and he pitched against a team from rival Matawan. Um, <laughs> Keyport reportedly won the game uh, by a score of two nothing behind Matthewson's uh, one hitter performance. Uh, very remarkable. He really mowed down a lot of those Matawan batters, uh, scoring 15 strikeouts over the course of the game. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there's this huge rivalry between the two towns um, in a lot of instances uh, across the country, um, especially within our area, especially within New Jersey, uh, baseball players would make a little extra money by kind of barnstorming or or getting uh, paid by local business leaders or by uh, by past contacts, whether they're college buddies or or just friends from from the communities they grew up in, uh, they would get brought into these towns um, like celebrities, and they would they would get involved in some of these local baseball games. Um, a lot of other shore towns um, had baseball games that included uh, guys like Babe Ruth. Uh, Joe DiMaggio, players like that from the Yankees. A lot of Yankees legends uh, played in places like Asbury Park, Belmar, uh, and whatnot. And really, it was just just uh, to to get uh, in front of a lot of the local fans, um, as well as to make a little extra money. Um, and most of these games were exhibitions, but you can see from the the Matawan Keyport game, uh, it looks like it probably got a little heated with those fifteen strikeouts. There wasn't a whole lot of mercy shown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah there was there was one guy who uh probably was swinging for his life uh and and managed to make contact off of uh Matthewson. <laughs> uh this next individual i'll pass it back over to al um is another individual who has ties to madawan and keyport <laughs> her name is juanita hall and she was uh, very from an early age became uh, very involved in singing. She graduated uh, from uh, Keyport High School, went on to uh, you know uh, uh, fine uh, education in in college, and she actually became a Broadway star. And uh, she uh, she performed in the 1949 version of South Pacific. She was Bloody Mary, and uh, she won a Tony Award for this. And she was the first African American to ever win a Tony Award uh, in in, in broad, Broadway history. She actually uh, uh, she died in uh, 1968. She is buried in uh, in one of our, our Matawan uh, cemeteries. I actually visited her grave. I, I was there, and I was starting humming some of the tunes from uh, South Pacific. So maybe I shouldn't have. She might, but she, I think she got a kick out of it. But she actually is one of those one of those people that uh, uh, she is buried in our town, and uh, she's contributed to you know many of the things uh, in in the history of Broadway. This also is. Uh, uh, I wish I could swim like that. Gertrude, I wish I could swim, period. Now, she, Gertrude Ed Ederly, uh, who actually, uh, she has a connection to uh, the Rare and Bayshore because her father had a summer home in the Rare and Bayshore. She became the first woman to swim the English Channel in 1926. And also in that 1924 uh, Olympic Games in Paris, France, uh, she won. She in three different categories. She medaled. So, uh, as she often attributed to some of her early swimming from being a, right along uh, the Highlands and the Bay Shore, and she certainly got quite a bit of mileage out of that as a as a, not just a female athlete, but a, a great athlete. This is uh, Al's favorite singer songwriter, uh, John Bon Jovi. <laughs> <laughs> this this is one of our favorite photos from the book just because it screams 1980s it's just really phenomenal um really bon jovi doesn't need much introduction in really probably any any rooms across the country across the world um but he's a he's from Saraville, new jersey graduate of Saraville war memorial high school uh although his career uh took him all throughout the country including stops in california and whatnot uh bon jovi has really had 
close ties to um, not only the Bayshore communities, but also to the to Monmouth County. Um, he still has a, has a residence here in the area um, and, and really has a lot of close ties to a lot of, of charities, um, as well as a lot of uh, the local music scene and whatnot. And there's a rest stop name for him. It's Bon Jovi restaurant. So <laughs> as you're, you know, uh, enjoying that rest stop, remember Bon Jovi. I also discovered Bon Jovi in a different way. Uh, I've also done a lot of, you know, historical talks on various topics. And one thing that, uh, it sounds strange, my other things, but uh, I, I have studied the, the history of the funeral business. And I've done a lot of different talks like that. In fact, we were, we were at one, uh, it was out at Atlantic Highlands. I was doing a speech on the, the history of the funeral business. And uh, my wife comes up and, and tells me, uh, you, you've been talking for two hours. This is in a fire hall. And all the people are sitting there. And she said, these people need, need they've got to go to work. They've got to leave. So I, I stood up there and I said, oh, please, I, when I, whenever I'm excited about something, I tend to talk about it and I get carried away. And uh, I, I'm so sorry. Thanks for being here. And uh, it, it's so nice to meet all of you. I'll be around a little bit longer if, if any of you have any questions. No one left. They stayed for another half hour of the questions about the funeral industry. And I found out that Bon Jovi's father uh, was a funeral director and had actually had several funeral homes in that area. And I, you know, I wonder if his movement toward rock and roll had anything to do with being raised in a funeral home. And it probably didn't, but uh, most people don't quite realize that he had kind of a, a varied background growing up. <laughs> Uh, this next particular individual um, is is someone who I was a big fan of as a boxing fan growing up. Uh, this is John Molnar. Uh, John discovered boxing at the age of 15 when he started training at the Middletown Pal Police Athletic League. Uh, John went on to fight professionally from 1997 to 2005. Um, Despite never obtaining a title shot, he gained notoriety within the boxing community for fighting on a number of undercards for notable professional boxers. Uh, these undercards feature guys like Lennox Lewis, Arturo Gatti, and Pernell Whitaker. Really a lot of fighters that, that were very popular over the course of, of the late 80s to the early 2000s. Um, John was really a staple in the local boxing scene. Uh, and like I mentioned, he's one of these guys that's really could be considered a local sports star. Um, unfortunately, John tragically passed away uh, on the job uh, in, on May 31st, 2022. John was 47 years old. He died in a tragic work-related accident uh, here in Middletown. Um, I actually was talking to John um, about a week before he passed, uh, tragically, and we were talking about which photo um, he wanted uh, in the book in particular. Um, he ne unfortunately never got to pick the photo that he wanted, but we went with this one because this was the photo that was included with his New Jersey Boxing Hall of Fame induction. This uh, next particular movie poster is for Clerks. Um, this was a movie that was created by Kevin Smith, who is pretty much local royalty around here, a, a Highlands native, um, who has done a number of movies that are, are really set within his native New Jersey. Kevin also has the store in Red Bank, Jane Silent Bob's Secret Stash. Uh, Clerks is a film that spurred a couple of sequels to it. It was very popular. The first movie was shot in black and white due to uh, budget uh, constraints. And the movie included a ton of local people. There were a lot of guys that Kevin Smith had grown up with or who had met within various circles, like his film interests, his comic book interests, and things of that nature. Um, some of the individuals that, that starred in this film, as well as the sequels, and included uh, Old Bridge's Brian O'Halloran. Um, and, and, and again, a number of other guys from the Highlands and Atlantic Highlands also made appearances, uh, including Atlantic Highlands' Jeff Anderson, who also had a starring uh, part in this film. Um, you can see the two guys that I just mentioned are on the left and the right of the poster, uh, respectively. Um, yeah, please. Uh, we have, I was talking about Roseville Cemetery, 
And actually, Clark Three, they filmed the cemetery scenes out at Rose Hill Cemetery. I went down there while they were filming, and I, I, I volunteered my services. If you have any questions about the spirits, or if you need more cooperation from this, but it, it's it's a very interesting movie because he comes in at the very end of the movie, and he comes out of character during the whole movie. Uh, he's but he's talking at the very end while they're showing all the credits and things like that. He said he actually worked in a convenience store. And a lot of things that appeared in the, the movie, which is a comedy, are things that actually happened to him while he was working in uh, uh, like a 7-Eleven type store. Some of the interactions, some are obviously, you know, uh, dramatized a little bit more than that for Hollywood. But uh, it, it's kind of interesting that... Uh, and this was filmed basically in Leonardo. And so the Leonardo with all of these characters and all of this happening uh, for someone who's never been before, it was kind of an introduction when you watch this, all three versions, Clerks 1, 2, and 3, of what uh, what it's like in the, in the summertime and other times. <laughs> and last, but certainly not least, um, we'll end it with uh, one of our current sports stars. Um, Connor Clifton. Connor Clifton actually just got signed by the Buffalo Sabres to a nice contract. Uh, Connor grew up on the same street I did actually in Matawan. So he's neighbors with uh, some of my relatives that are still in that area um, or his family, at least his neighbors. Um, Connor is a professional ice hockey defensive man. Um, he's been in the NHL for a few seasons now. Um, he started off um, out of uh, Christian Brothers Academy where he played high school hockey and was a star in high school at CBA. Um, he went on to play at Quinnipiac University. This is one of the photos of him uh, while he's playing in college. He had a, he and his brother actually, Tim, had a very storied um, college hockey career. Uh, both of them went on to be drafted into the NHL. Uh, Tim is currently retired from the game. Uh, he didn't, he didn't make it as far as Connor, but like I mentioned, Connor had time with uh, the minor leagues within uh, Arizona Coyotes. Um, and then most of his notoriety, his recent notoriety, it came uh, while he was a member of the Boston Bruins. And when he played for the Boston Bruins during the 2018 to 2019 season, he was a part of that Eastern Conference championship team uh, that ultimately fell to the St. Louis Blues in the Stanley Cup that season. It was pretty cool to come back to this area, to come back to Matawan and, and drive around and see a record number of Boston Bruins jerseys and, and hats and whatnot, especially in an area that's traditionally uh, uh, fairly hostile to the Boston Bruins. <laughs> But uh, but definitely uh, a lot of pride in Connor and a lot of his accomplishments um, in the NHL. Um, that ultimately that concludes our presentation. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. It was it was again it was an honor and a privilege to stand before you and talk to you about some local history in the Raritan Bayshore. Um, and thank you, Tom. Thank you, Randy. Thank you to the Middletown Township uh, Historical Society. They have books for sale, like uh, the Dig and Turtle Island for you. And uh, we have about five minutes only if anybody has any questions. Yes. Both of the historians have written books of the publishers and share stories of that. And the real debate, they weren't going to. I think maybe in um, the real debate was was this in fact a graveyard shell that could be attacked, or there could have been a type of people living as humans, so the shell could be um, or was it a gold shell? And there's a lot of evidence to support the gold shell. I don't know, you said the red reminder of the people that really was. I wonder if you come down on either side as we come to. The only problem, yeah, I do come down on the juvenile great white because uh, bull sharks and great whites don't look alike. They have different styles of attack. If you have bull sharks tend to, uh, to completely a stealth attack. You'll never see a bull shark before, but often with great whites, often they'll poke their nose up and take a look, then go down for the attack. Also, there were a number of people at the time in, in the newspaper reports 
who commented on the white, white underbelly that the kids actually saw, and they were right there with them. And there were enough witnesses that it wasn't just one person's idea. A lot of people, different people, you know, saw this. So uh, with that in mind, uh, probably also uh, Rich Fernicola, who wrote a book called 12 Days of Terror, uh, we, we tend to agree, agree of this, this particular one, most likely was, uh, you know, a, a juvenile great white, because just the, the night, if it, if it had been a situation where you didn't have that many witnesses, uh, it could, could be this way or that way. And uh, they just, there's too many things pointing in one direction. And that's why I, I would have to say the, the favor, it, it, even the possibility of this, the, the, the weight of the evidence probably would be pushed toward the juvenile great white. And in Jaws, he did depict the great white as the thing on the surface and then a quick dive and then pop, attack it up. You know, so. Yeah, that, that's a style of a great way. Um, not to be greedy, but I know it's limited time. As a hockey is my favorite sport, actually. So, follow up. Connor, let's get his book. It sounds like he's in his late 20s now, maybe 30. Yeah, yeah, he's in his uh, late 20s right now. Yeah, he's. He uh, just signed with the Buffalo Sabres, so yeah, he got a he got a nice contract. So yeah, yeah, he was a free agent after being with uh, the Bruins. They didn't they didn't resign him for some reason. Yeah, just the summer. Yep, it was probably I think it was two weeks ago is when he signed. July first is when the free agent. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> yes. I just like to point out in terms of Stafford. Um, what was his name, Stafford? Oh, okay. Stafford Little. Little, right. Yeah. Uh, his devotion to Princeton football team. I just want to remind everybody that Rutgers beat Princeton at the very first football yeah. team. It was theirs. Well, all right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. How are you? Yeah.